Well, as I said, it is the end of the series. Um, day 50, and it's, they say that you can establish a habit in about 14 days. So if you've been following along in your journals, if you've been involved in a growth group over this last semester, if you've been letting God work in your life and show you new things, I wanted you to reflect this morning on what he's done. And if we go back to the beginning of this, we started with an encouraging story of a little girl who had all kinds of obstacles in life. With birth defects, with all kinds of struggles and disease, she saw life going one direction and everybody else saw it going a very different one. But she had faith. And she believed that with God, all things are possible. And if you remember the end of the story, she went from not being able to walk to being an Olympic champion runner. Because all things are possible with God. It doesn't mean that everything that we wish and hope for, he's going to do. But it does mean he wants us to wish and hope and dream in him. And to follow along with what he's doing. And so, I encourage you, and we, we asked the question in the first week. If you had no fear of failure, what would you attempt for God? And I pray that that thought has been running through your mind and your heart and your soul over the last 49 days. Would you be considering, if it wasn't for my fear of failure, what is it that God would have me do with my life? And there's a reason why we ask such a question. We've been going to this verse every week. And when someone becomes a Christian, he becomes a brand new person inside. He is not the same anymore. A new life has begun. And that makes all the difference. On the day when you put your faith in Jesus Christ to be your Savior and say, I want to stop trying to do it all for me all the time. It's not working. And Jesus, I want my life to be about you instead. Something happens inside of us. Our spiritual position changes altogether because we go from being away from God and apart from him to eternal life with him in that moment. And God begins something brand new inside of us. And we grow to learn and to trust him and it makes all the difference. So as we got into these weeks, I've been daring you to dream again because that's what God wants us as believers to do to dream and to to seek him, and then to follow. So I've dared you about lots of things. In the first week, I dared you to let God heal your painful past. Because for many of us, it's like these old barriers back here that are worn and faded. We've been dragging around all kinds of stuff. Things that we thought were the truth, but they were lies. Things about us that we let the rest of the world tell us who we are instead of believing what God's word said that you're a child of the king, that you'll spend eternity with him. And you don't have to let all of the things that have happened to you define where you're going. The path that you've been on does not have to define the path that you go on from this day forward. I the freedom in Christ to follow him. So in week one, I dared you to let God heal your painful past. In week two, I dared you to discover God's present involvement in your life. God didn't just create you and let you go. God has been present in your life. And the challenge was to look for that, to acknowledge the way. And that's why our praise list has been growing on our prayer sheet. As we've looked at the way that God is involved in our daily lives and the different ways that he is. And when we acknowledge that, we begin to see it more and more. In week three, I dared you to establish godly goals for your life. To take a look at the path that you're on and the things that you are aspiring to be with the days that you have left. And do they line up with God's heart? Or are they just a self-seeking hope for joy that will never get you there? Do you have godly goals in your life about who you believe God wants you to be? In week four, I dared you to empower everything you do for God with prayer. Because all of our efforts, if they don't have a focus and a start in prayer, All of our good ideas, all of our things that we want to do, even if they're noble causes, if they're not surrounded in prayer so we keep hearing God's voice readjust us, they'll fail. We have to empower everything that we seek after doing with God's power through prayer. 
In week five, I dared you to confront your ungodly prejudices. Because if there's things in your life that you are avoiding, if there are people that you're saying, ah, not them, then we're going to miss all that God would have for us as we try to follow the dream that he's got. If we're trying to exclude certain people. So the dare for you in week five was to confront your ungodly prejudices. And many of you shared things that I hadn't really thought about that. But when I take time to think about it and I pray about it, I realize there's things I need to begin doing differently. In week six, I dared you to identify with God's heart for the world. To think about what it means to be a world-class Christian. To think about God's heart for the world and our, our desire to see all the world come to know Jesus. If you were in the growth groups, we talked about the 1040 window, which is where the largest concentration of people who don't know Jesus Christ is at from 10 degrees north to 40 degrees north. And if you take a look at a map and you see the, the missions map in the back, you see there's a lot of missionaries that are in that area. And there's a lot down at the bottom that say undisclosed location because they're serving in countries where we can't broadcast that they're there. If we were to say on our website or on Facebook or announce their names, their governments are searching websites to look for them. And they could be thrown in prison. They could be tortured. So there's lots of missionaries. When you go back and look at that map, pray especially for the ones at the bottom who are serving God in places where we can't tell you where they're at because of what would happen to them if their governments knew. Last week, I dared you to move with God beyond your comfort zones because all of us get comfort in patterns of life. And for some of us, there's things that God is just opened a door. He's waiting for you to say, I, will you step out? Will you do that thing that you've been so afraid of doing? Will you walk across the room and share the love of Jesus with somebody who needs him? So to move out of our comfort zones. And this week, I'm going to dare you to believe that with God all things are possible, even as his word declares. See, when we dream... Christmas is coming up. And some of you have shared when you were little kids, and you learned that if you really wanted something for Christmas, you put that third on your list. Number one, you would tell mom and dad, I want a pony. Because you knew that would never really happen. Number two, you told mom and dad, I want a little sister or a little brother. And they said, well, Santa doesn't bring those. And the third thing was the thing that you really wanted. And for many of us, we've kind of taken some of our dreams that God's placed in our hearts, and we've put it in the category one and category two of our Christmas wishes. We said, we know that would be really neat, and that would be awesome if that ever happened. But we just, we don't think it ever really will. And the challenge is to believe that with God, all things are possible. And it has to do with lining up our dreams with his dreams for the world around us. So this morning we're going to get into week eight. The question a lot have as they get to this point, as they've been going through the journey like this, is, is the dream in your heart truly from God? And we begin to have something called doubt. When we get to the end of the message, we're going to talk about someone that we knew from the Bible as a doubter and how he got kind of a bad rap. And that's what day 50 of is in your journal. So is the dream in your heart truly from God? And I think we find, or at least I do, I find some comfort in a, in a particular passage in God's Word. In Ephesians chapter 2, Paul is writing to the church in Ephesus and, and shares those truths about where we're at and what's changed in our lives. That we went from being dead to being alive in Christ because of faith in Him. And he says it's not because of the things that we've done. We need to remember that it's not about the things that we've done. So as I go through and I dream, I know that the dream in and of itself is not what makes the difference. Here's where we get to. We get that great promise in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. 
and this not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by work so that no one can boast. You see, the dream that God has placed on your heart is not about your boasting and saying, oh, look at the great thing that I accomplished. But he's placing the dream on your heart for a reason. And it, we get that in the next verse. It says, for we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. And that's where the comfort comes in. Because as we dream, as we open our hearts to God and say, what is it, Lord, that you want to use me in to change the world around me? We get this great promise that he's already prepared in advance works for us to do, and that's what we're created for. We're created with a purpose in mind. You. Through all of your hang-ups, through all of your flaws, for all of your perceived inabilities, God has uniquely created each one of you and me for a purpose. And he wants us to be open to him, to let him work in and through our lives to accomplish what he's prepared in advance for us to do. So I don't have to worry too much about this dream being too self-centered. Because if I'm in prayer, God's going to keep refining it. God's going to keep showing each one of us where do we fit. And so I want you to consider that this morning. I want you to consider in this moment on the last day of this series that God's prepared you for something great. It may not be great in the eyes of the world, but it has great value in his kingdom, in his eyes. So what are you dreaming about? What are you dreaming about? As we go through the dreams, the, the issue is, how do we face and overcome the barriers to fulfilling the dream God has given us? Because this series has been all about these barriers that pop up. How do we face them? And how do we overcome them to fulfill the dream that God has for us? So this morning, I want you to turn to Hebrews chapter 12. Turn in the Bible to Hebrews chapter 12. For some of you, it's a familiar passage. Hebrews is different than many of the other letters that we see in the New Testament. Now, some will attribute it to Paul because of some phrasing that's in here that's in some of his other letters. The style is different. And what I like about Hebrews is, well, I'm a pastor, so I like sermons. I, mean, I, I know I'm kind of weird. But Hebrews reads like a sermon. Because you see a pastor's heart when you go through the book of Hebrews, or the letter of Hebrews. Because as the writer writes, you see that he's dealing with people who are in a world that's falling apart all around them. And you see compassion out of a pastor's heart, knowing that people are frail. That they're weak emotionally, they're weak physically. But through the power of Jesus, our lives can change. And he gives us the strength to overcome the difficulties in life. And many of you are familiar with right before this, in chapter 11 of Hebrews, it's the great gallery of those who have lived by faith. Those who have believed in the promises of God and no matter what, gave their lives. Like we sang this morning, I surrender all, they did. And whether they saw what God had promised happen in their lifetime, or they're watching from heaven right now and seeing the things unfold that God had promised, wasn't the indicator to them of do I keep doing what God has told me to do. They did it. Whether it all made sense to them or not, they did it. They believed in the promise of God. And they gave their lives, many of them, to following after him. So this morning, we're going to look at a familiar passage in Hebrews chapter 12. And it begins with, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. 
and I have to stop and pray. God, I thank you for this encouragement that I find so often in your word as I read it. And this morning, Jesus, I just pray that you would help these words to sink into our hearts. That we would remember you. When all of the doubt creeps in over the dreams that you've placed on our hearts, may we remember you, Jesus. May we remember those who have gone before us. It is why for 2,000 years, mankind has been trying to put Christianity to an end. And yet your word prevails. Your word guides and directs. It is the same. We read it in a modern language, but the truth is there. So Jesus, this morning, may you open our hearts to you. That we will be ready to cast aside everything else and truly follow the dream that you have for us. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to do something a little different this morning. Now, normally, we read out of the NIV. It's the Bible that's in the pews if you use those. But sometimes we kind of lose focus because we've heard the words so many times. So I'm going to throw a paraphrase out there. And I encourage you every once in a while, pick up a different translation of God's Word and read through it and see again the meaning that's behind some of the words. Again, when you read something like the message, it's like somebody else just trying to explain it all to you. So this morning, I want us to look at how the message says these three verses. And I think it will help us to unpack what's here. Do you see what this means? All these pioneers who blaze the way, all these veterans cheering us on. It means we'd better get on with it. Strip down, start running, and never quit. No extra spiritual fat, no parasitic sins. And I'm mindful, and I know that today is Veterans Day. And we have soldiers on our list that I pray that you're continuing to keep in your prayers. And I am so grateful for all who went out and honored the veterans this past week and voted. Whether you got the guy or the lady in office that you wanted, I thank you for honoring the veterans. That's one of the greatest ways you can do that, is to honor the freedom that they fought for, that we have a free country to live in. Amen? Thank you for those who voted. I'm just disappointed by those who voted in other states. I'll just leave it at that. But he says, remember those who have gone on before you. A veteran is somebody who has already gone before you and knows the way. And we are reminded in God's word that there are those who God has placed dreams on their hearts and they followed with reckless abandon and they surrendered it all. Keep your eyes on Jesus, who both began and finished this race we're in. Study how he did it, because he never lost sight of where he was headed, that exhilarating finish in and with God. He could put up with anything along the way, cross, shame, whatever. And now he's there in the place of honor right alongside God. When you find yourselves flagging in your faith, go over that story again, item by item, that long litany of hostility he plowed through. That will shoot adrenaline into your souls. And that's my prayer, that God is going to shoot some adrenaline into your souls through the message that he's got for us this morning. He will shoot adrenaline into your souls. So we're going to look at four ways this morning. Four ways as you think of this passage in Hebrews that we overcome the barriers. And the first thing that comes to mind is to clear the clutter to begin following the dream. To clear the clutter, I've spent time, when I'm, when I'm at a hard point trying to work on a sermon, Penny can usually tell because she sees that I start going and cleaning things. When I'm struggling with knowing exactly what to do next or how to phrase something, you should see my bedroom now. My dresser is all cleared off. The desk is all neat and tidy. Um, my desk in here looks the best it has in months. How to end well, because today really isn't the ending. But to begin the journey, you've got to clear the clutter to begin the dream. And Growing up, I had a favorite movie. And I love these guys. We represent the lollipop guild. You know the song. I mean, I love it. In The Wizard of Oz, I think about the times I would go over to my aunt and uncle's house. I had second cousins who were a little older than me. 
Uh, my uncle worked for General Motors. My aunt was a real estate agent. They were loaded. I mean, they had horses out back. They had a TV downstairs in the basement, the pool table, the everything. I mean, it was great fun to go over because he had a train that was so amazing. And I got to play with it every now and then. But I remember many times when this would come on in the fall, we would go spend that Friday night. It would come on CBS and watch this. And I thought about Dorothy, and I thought about, wow, isn't that weird? She goes from a world of black and white and off-color tan to arriving in a place full of color. And the one thing that she wants to do is go back home. She wants to go back to what's familiar and where she knows she's loved. And if you remember, when she arrives on the scene, there's all of this commotion because they don't know exactly who Dorothy is, but she's done something great for the munchkins and killed the Wicked Witch of the East. And she says, but you don't understand. I want to go home. I have a dream. I want to be back where I'm supposed to be. And you remember this awesome line from Glinda. She says, it's always best that you start at the beginning and all you do is follow the yellow brick road. If you want to get to where you want to be, there is a way. You have to start at the beginning. You've got to clear all the other stuff out of the way. And all of the neat things and these little people and everything else. Don't let them become a distraction. If you want to return, there is but one way. And it's to follow the path. Now, ours isn't a yellow brick road yet. Some of us have gold lining on the edges of the page that tells us the path. And we know that when we get there, there are going to be streets that are lined with gold. Because that's a promise of, it's a picture of what heaven is like. We need to follow the path. Clear the clutter. Hebrews, it says, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run the perseverance the race marked out for us. If you're going to run the race and follow the path that God has for you, if you're going to do it with endurance, it's got to start with clearing the clutter. Throw off everything that hinders. Not everything that hinders is sin. Clearly, we know if we're believers in Jesus Christ that sin ain't such a good thing. It cost Jesus his life. It's the reason that he had to leave heaven to come here and die on a cross for us. Well, that's kind of a no-brainer for most of us to get rid of the sin. The sin that so easily entangles but it says throw off everything else that hinders us. We talked about that with being a world-class Christian, that there are so many things that are okay and maybe good and may not even be really all that bad that we can get caught up in, and it just it holds us back. It's like running with dragging something behind you. You may be able to do it for a little while, but it gets pretty tiring. And for some of us, we've been running around and trying to go forward and dragging barriers along with us. We haven't cut the strings. We want to run with perseverance, the race that he has marked out for us. The second thing is to stay focused on Jesus. If you want to see the dream that God has brought into your heart happen, you've got to stay focused. Now, I'm not sure what it is yet. In fact, I don't know if anybody's done a lawsuit. But I know that when I go into stores like Walmart, or Staples, or Best Buy, I know they've gotten together and they've developed some kind of formula that they put in the vents that makes me want to stay there longer and buy things I had no idea I needed. And maybe you've done that too. You've gone into the store and you went in for one thing and you came out with so many more things that you didn't realize you needed. And the reality is you know you didn't really need them, but... They sure look neat, even if you didn't even know they made those things yet. And the problem is we get distracted. We get distracted and we lose focus on Jesus. It's pretty easy for us to get a picture of that with all of the Amish that are around us. Now, when you see their buggies going along the road, many of you have grown up here. So it's something that's kind of commonplace for you. For me, still seeing a, a horse going down a road that has cars blazing by at 55 plus, it's still kind of a weird thing. But then I'm reminded, the horse has something on to keep the horse 
directed in one direction. It's little things called blinders. Because they keep the horse from getting distracted by all the other neat things that are out here to the side of him. We need, at times, spiritual blinders to keep our focus on what Jesus is calling us to. To keep headed in the right direction. Some of you may have been out on a boat at night. It's fun being out on the water during the day. But at night, things are altogether different. Because the things that you're used to looking for aren't there anymore. Growing up, my parents had a cottage that was on the golf course, not on the lake. And I always loved going out for the 4th of July and watching the fireworks shot off the island in the middle of the lake and being out there. But it was always kind of weird at the end because how do I know out of all of those points of light out there, which one's the dock that's going to lead us back to our house? All the familiar things. I'm used to looking for that one big brown house that was there and our really long dock that we shared with the three streets that were there. But it's different at night. Sailors know when they're out on the ocean when they were beginning to sail from Europe to the New World. You navigate by something called the North Star. It's a fixed point of light that doesn't move throughout the night sky. If I can always know where that's at, I can go in relation to that. And I can, I can go in the direction I need to go to. And it's the same thing with our walk of faith. To follow the dream that God has for us, we've got to stay on the right path. We've got to have that point of reference to stay focused on Jesus. Calvin Miller was uh, an author. He was a college professor. He was a pastor who died this past August, and he wrote 40 different books of encouragement on faith. And he said this in the book of Seven Truths. He says, Never love life more than the reason it was given to you. Never love life more than the reason it was given to you. And for many of us, there's so many neat things. I mean, the Black Friday ads have already come out. I mean, isn't it awesome that Walmart is going to be open like at 8 o'clock on Thanksgiving night? Forget having to get up at 5 a.m. to go to the stores. You can go Thanksgiving evening at 8 o'clock already. Isn't that great? You see, we get distracted by all these things that really don't matter. They're vying for our attention in ways that have never been done before. We need to stay focused on Jesus. And not get caught up in all of the, the blessings of life and miss the reason why we've been given life. And Hebrews said, Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Now, it's great, and many of us can start there. But something happens. The third thing is to focus on Jesus when the circumstances get discouraging. And... While we don't know all the promises in life, there are two that we can kind of take to the bank. There will be discouragement because it won't go the way we thought it would. And there will be pain. Now, John Lennon, take him for whatever you want to, uh, a philosopher of music. Now, I listened to this song. It's not one that I would write. It's not a style, but I had to listen to it because I've heard this line. He wrote a song to his son, Sean, and I'm not going to sing it this morning. But in the song, Beautiful Boy, he said, Life is just what happens to you while you're busy making other plans. Life is just what happens to you while you're busy making other plans. Life doesn't follow the script that we've written. We're going to get discouraged. We're going to fall down. But how do we get past it? Do we focus on Jesus? Do we stay focused on him when things get discouraging? He's taught us the way. It said in Hebrews 12, 3, Consider him who endured. Consider him who endured so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. And in between those dots, put all the stuff that you've gone through. Consider him who endured pain. Consider him who endured embarrassment. Consider him who endured shame. Consider him who endured name-calling. Consider him who endured whatever you've gone through. He's gone through it. Consider him who endured all of those things so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. He's given us such great promises. Whatever pain in life you're facing right now, whatever uncertainty you've got in the future, 
That was all part of God's understanding when he made you. And it's all part of fulfilling the dream that he has for your life. The dream that he has for our church together. These things are not surprises to him. But he's shown us the way. And maybe you just need to remember one thing. Remember that Jesus makes the dream possible. It's not by our own talents. It's not by our own good looks. It's not by our own skills. It's not by our own influence over others. It all goes back to Jesus. And Jesus is the one that causes us to dream. And I put this promise at the end of our prayer list every week when I send it. And I pray that you don't just stop at the last name on the list. I pray that you read this every single week. Because when we make this our life verse, something different happens. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine. And you can put the word dream in there. According to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. You can't outdream God. Now, you may come up with things that don't fit, but as you dream and as you pray and as you seek him, he refines it. He draws us through his word. He draws us through the church. He draws us through other believers. He draws us through the circumstances we face to get closer to him, to know the dream that he has for us. In your guidebooks, if you haven't been using those, uh, I want to encourage you to turn to page 75. If you haven't done anything else in this series, day 50 is the one. Day 50 is the one, and maybe you need to begin the next 50 days going back through it. I encourage you. It's one of the things that it says in your book as you get to the end of it, to go back. And on day 50, we get the story of a man who, oh, we give him a bad rap. His name's Thomas. In fact, we use the phrase doubting Thomas these days because of things that we've seen in his word. We've seen God's word written about Thomas. And some of it's just not fair. Some of it's just not fair. So I want to encourage you, if you've not done day 50 yet, go home this afternoon and do day 50. And then go back and begin day one. And pick up the days that you've missed. And let God speak into your hearts again as you get ready for Christmas over the next 50 days. But in John chapter 20, verses 24 to 31, we learn some lessons from Thomas about dealing with doubt. Now, to set the stage to make it fair, remember that Jesus has already appeared to the disciples, minus Thomas. I don't know why Thomas wasn't there the first time they were in the upper room with the doors locked shut. And we always think about doubting Thomas, doubting Thomas. And, but wait, let's go back. Let's read the story again in our minds. When Mary arrived at the tomb and came back and told everybody, he's risen, he's not there. What was the reaction to the disciples? We don't believe you. And eventually they ran back and took a look. And at first, they doubted and they didn't believe. And it wasn't until they saw Jesus in front of them, as they were living in fear for what the Jews and the Romans might do to them, huddled up in a room with the doors locked, it says, that Jesus appeared and said, peace be with you. What do we learn from Thomas? Number one, Jesus never rebuked Thomas. Jesus never said, you're bad. Jesus, you should have believed. Thomas, you should have believed. The first thing Jesus says is, Thomas, it's me. Here. Take a look. Touch and see and believe that it's me. So I want you to think about that when you're dealing with doubt in your life. When there are times where it's hard for you to believe that the dream that God could have for you is going to happen. Remember that Jesus' first thing that he did to Thomas was not to rebuke him. Jesus met him where he was. Jesus addresses our doubts. 
Jesus understood what Thomas's hang-up was, and he speaks directly to him and says, here you go. And that's what I want to encourage you to do. Whenever you have those times where you're beginning to doubt that God couldn't really want that to happen, or it really couldn't be through me, go to him. Understand he's not going to be rebuking you because of you of little faith. That's not his first desire. His desire is to strengthen and encourage us. He addresses our doubts. And then we need to have a reaction like Thomas. When God speaks to us, we need to be ready to move to action. Thomas didn't just say, oh, that's neat. Okay, Jesus, I guess you did rise. And Thomas said, my Lord and my God, and then began to do what God had called them to do. He was there throughout the rest when they heard the words, go into all the world and share the good news. I want to encourage you this morning that if you're in a spot in doubt and you're looking around and saying, I just don't know how God's going to do it. I just wish he'd use somebody else but me. God, that thing at your place in my heart's just too big. There's just no way. I want you to take encouragement this morning that over the next 50 days, you will let God continue to speak into your hearts to be ready to celebrate Christmas in a brand new way this year. We've been sharing these verses over and over, and uh, I want to encourage us one last time to stand and share them together, to share out of Philippians chapter 3 these promises. So would you stand with me? Those in the growth groups have been doing really good at this. I've had a little board in the back, and I would start out the first week just doing the first couple verses of this. And then we began dropping out words and putting blanks in with the first letter for that word. And then when everybody could get that, we'd drop off that first letter. And then we added the last verse to it. And I, just, I thank you for the work that you're doing to put these promises into your hearts. So do you share them with me? I don't mean to say that I have already achieved these things or that I have already reached perfection. But I press on to possess that perfection for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. No, dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it, but I focus on this one thing. Forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead, I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God through Christ Jesus, is calling us. Let's pray. Father, as we come to this point at the end of the series, in day 50, Father, it's just the beginning. So I pray that today you would empower us to clear the clutter out of our lives and follow you. That Jesus, we would hold to the truths of your word. That we would focus on you, Jesus, that as we get distracted by all the other things in life that vie for our attention, that we would stay focused on you. And even when the discouragement comes, because we know in this life that you love us, but we know that doesn't mean we won't see pain or discouragement, but it gives us hope. We know that we don't walk the path alone. So Jesus, continue and help us to remember that it's all about you. The dreams that you've placed on our hearts are about following you, and when the doubts come, that you're able, Lord Jesus, it doesn't surprise you, and you're ready to meet us at our need and to encourage us and to bring us back into a life of action in fulfilling the dreams that you call us to do. Father, it won't happen if we don't do it. If we don't live our lives in such a way that opens us up to you, to get rid of all the things that entangle us, like sin and even the good things that aren't in pursuit of following the dream you've given us, then something is missing. So, Father, today, thank you that you've called each one of us to follow you and to follow the dream that you've placed on our hearts. Father, dare us to dream again. And as we do that and we obey you and we give to you tithes and offerings and our time and talent as well, we know, Lord, it's not because we'll be looking for what was missing, but we'll be looking to see what's been gained because of your work in our lives. So this morning, 
take each gift and use it for your purposes. Guide us in how to be your church. Bless each gift and each giver, Lord. Thank you for hearts that are open to following you and trusting you in big ways and small. Jesus, thank you for your work that we can be a part of around the corner and around the world. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.